Yo, it's your old pal Lance from Permanent Records back again with another video. This time I'm doing kind of a hot take, another hot take on a very specific subject. The wonderful world of private pressings. Private press LPs are a thing that a lot of very serious collectors are very, very familiar with. That said, I understand that not everybody gets it. It's an odd, odd world, and it is very diverse. So I'm here to kind of break down, for those of you who don't really uh, care enough about getting into really, really obscure records or really esoteric genres of music, Maybe you're a record collector that really loves mainstream music, and that's all right. There's nothing wrong with that whatsoever. A lot of the best music ever created is on a major label and is very, very mainstream. There's a reason why Fleetwood Mac and the Beatles and the Rolling Stones and Led Zeppelin and whatever, those are just rock artists that I'm talking about. Not to mention the biggest names in hip hop and electronic music, etc. There's a lot of reasons why those artists have sold millions of copies, maybe even billions of copies of their records on major labels. They are very talented artists for the most part. The world of private pressing is not without its element of talent. There is a very, very high, high percentage of very, very talented musicians who self-released their own music over the years, whether it be on vinyl LPs from the 60s, 70s, 80s, and beyond, or digitally in, you know, the 21st century. Either way, I'm here to discuss private press vinyl records, primarily LPs in this particular video, although there are private press 45s, of course, and uh, why collectors like myself love them so much, what we find appealing about them, and um, also, you know, showcase some of the examples from my private collection. As you can see, I have two records here behind me. I'll talk about them and more as soon as my cat stops messing around and you subscribe to this channel. Please, 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 thank you in advance for subscribing to the channel, liking this video, clicking the, clicking and clicking and tapping and ringing that bell, and then also leaving me a comment below. I try my best to respond to every comment that I receive, and I really enjoy the discourse that goes on in the comments section below. So, without further ado, let's get into the wonderful world of private pressings. Okay, first and foremost, I'd like to share with you three very, very important pieces of literature that deal with this subject specifically. I've talked about this ad nauseum, as have many other members of the vinyl community. If you want to get into the world of private press records, you have to have the Acid Archives. This is a, an essential volume that reviews a lot of Acid or, or a lot of private pressing albums from the mid '60s to the early '80s. I think the cutoffs 1982, but it also delves pretty deep into um, tax scam record releases, um, you know, micro label releases and also some very, very obscure esoteric major label releases. So this is one source of, um, a great source of information about private pressings and not just private pressings. It also includes uh, information about the value or the rarity of any given record. Um, there's lists in the back of the book that kind of guide you through the world of private pressings and some of the records included in this book. There are special features on uh, different genres, sub, micro, kind of esoteric, oddball genres of music, and that is essential reading. Owning this book for that if nothing else, makes it very much worth, uh, I should say, those elements of this book 
are worth the entry price alone. It's not uh, difficult to obtain. I believe it's available on Amazon um, and other places. You don't have to just go to Amazon for everything these days. Um, for around 40 bucks. The second edition, that's what I have. Um, there's a first edition. I sold mine when this came out because they added things to it. Little did I know they took things out of this edition, so now I kind of want to have both, but I also don't really feel like I need that. I've spent a lot of time with this book. I've, you know, taken, taken a lot of crazy notes uh, over the years on records that I want to check out. I've, you know, really, really immersed myself. I would consider myself a scholar in the Acid Archives at this point. Fantastic book cannot speak highly enough about that. All right, and another great resource is the Feel the Music, the psycho Psychotic and Psychedelic Worlds of Paul Major. That's what this book is. There are two editions of this. There's this regular edition of the book, which is just fine. It's awesome. Uh, fine for most folks is what I'm trying to say. This is an amazing read. I highly recommend you check it out. There's lots of great information in here, lots of great photos, etc. And this just happens to be the deluxe kind of like limited edition box version of it that comes with this extra uh, Paul Major photo book and so on and so forth. That's what I have. So if you're not already familiar with Paul Major, Paul Major is and was, and always shall be, a record collector. He's also a musician, a musicologist, a very, very knowledgeable scholar of a lot of different types of music. And um, he is also one of the people who in the 80s started trading private press records with other collectors. He created a catalog of uh, trade fodder and records he had for sale called Feel the Music, hence the title of this book. <laughs> wow, that's fun. Um, and he sold very rare and common and esoteric and obscure and major label records uh, of all different genres, primarily psych and outsider and real people and obscure um, musics. So this book is quite great, tells the history of Paul's uh, life as a record collector, a musician, and a record dealer um, through his mail order catalog in the 80s, 90s, and maybe even slightly beyond that. Anyway, this is a great book. I assume it's currently available. I'm not sure. Um, I haven't looked into that. I have a copy, so I haven't shopped for it recently. But you should own it if you can get your hands on a copy. And a third volume here is Enjoy the Experience. My pals, Ethan Alipat and Jeffrey Weiss, work together with a bunch of other co-editors, uh, including Paul Major and Michael P. Daly. Uh, Greg Turkington, um, AKA Neil Hamburger, contributed to this book. Uh, Will Louvier, who was a Acid Archives contributor. Uh, Rich Hoff, Douglas McGowan, both Acid Archives contributors. Mike Asherman, a member of the original Psych Mafia, uh, alongside um, Paul Major. Uh, all contributed to this book. It's amazing. There are photos of incredibly strange and rare and interesting private press albums. Uh, I also have bookmarks in my copy, obviously. And anyway, it's an incredible resource and will shed way more light on the wonderful world of private press LPs than I could possibly do in this short video here. And I am gonna keep it short because I could go on all day about this subject. Uh, it's one of my favorite elements of record collecting and I do focus very heavily, please forgive me, it's very warm. It's a warm October day here in Los Angeles and I am a little sweaty. So anyway, onto the records. First and foremost, we have 
one of the quintessential private pressings here. One of the first records that Paul Major discovered of uh, self-released private pressings, the Kenneth Higney Attic demonstration LP. This is a very great example of outsider real people music and that is one of the many, many reasons why people get down with self-produced albums and private pressings. The fact that records that sound like this can exist is amazing and would never, well, let's not say never, but mostly not happen in a world where records are only released on major labels with teams of people editing the material. Uh, and yeah, Kenneth Higney is unadulterated and this is a, this is an indescribable uh, real people record of epic proportions, attic demonstration. I'll leave it at that. I do not want to spoil what that album sounds like for you because if you've never heard that and you are in the mood to hear something as far out as you could ever possibly imagine, you gotta hear Attic Demonstration. Okay, and I'll leave the story behind the discovery of that record and Paul tracking down Kenneth Higney for you to read in his book, uh, Feel the Music. And then, secondarily, we have things like this amazing album. This is also a private pressing by Gary Higgins this album's called Red Hash. This album is not real people. It is not outsider. This is very accessible, fairly accessible uh, music. It's a folk record, but it's got some rock elements to it. It definitely has a propulsive vibe to it. It does not uh, rest on its laurels. And this album in particular is one of my favorite private pressings of all time. Gary Higgins only ever released this in his lifetime. No, I'm sorry, he's st still alive. He only ever released this in real time. Drag City has released, re-released, reissued this album and other recordings by Gary Higgins. And I've yet to hear a Gary Higgins song that I didn't like on any of those records. And if you are into things like Skip Spence and his album, or or more modern um, singer-songwriters like Elliot Smith, I highly recommend this album. This thing has got, this thing has mass appeal, and I find it to be one of the most enjoyable private pressings that exists. And not just because it's strange or esoteric or weird, because it's just eminently enjoyable, and it just happened to be self-released back in the day. So that. Uh, to me, are two of the major reasons why uh, private pressings are interesting. There are incredibly strange records in this world, but there are really, really accessible and just thoroughly uh, um, poppy albums that came out um, on artists' own imprints back in the day. And you can only imagine the process by which it might have, uh, the difficulty with which artists would have had to self-release their album back in a pre-internet age. First of all, the expense of recording was astronomical uh, compared to what it is now where everything is completely democratized and uh, easy to do at home. You had to A, you know, work your stuff out before you even went into a studio, B, uh, afforded the time and or found a studio near you and if you didn't live in a major metropolitan area that might not have been very easy and then C you had to then take those recordings get them to a record pressing plant and put together this artwork or that artwork somehow I don't even know exactly how they would have done this back in the day it just seems like such an arduous task especially before Photoshop and Pro Tools, so on and so forth. The modern conveniences and technology that we have make it so much easier to self-release your music. And that is another element of why I love private pressing so much. The fortitude and gumption and desire and drive that these artists had to put these albums out 
really shines through in the recordings on a lot of them. Some of them are mundane and boring and whatever, but the best of the best have all of those elements. I've talked ad nauseum about hard rock private pressing, so I won't go deep into that world in this particular video. Uh, we reissued, I tracked down Randy Oda and worked with Riding Easy Records uh, to reissue this album, this 1973 hard rock album from the Bay Area. There are reissues of this particular pri this was originally a private pressing on Randy Oda's own Loud Records imprint. Um, so even though there might be a label attached to these releases, a lot of times it's the artist's own fabricated label. They did only their own releases on the label and that was that. But anyway, if you want a great example of super, super well-produced uh, hard rock from 1973, go check out the Oda album uh, on Writing Easy Records and you can buy a copy of the reissue for yourself at PermanentRecordsLA.com. All right, so many of you, even those of you who may not even know what I'm talking about immediately when I say the word private pressing, are familiar with Donnie and Joe Emerson. This album is incredible, and it was discovered by my pal Jack Fleischer, who is a local record collector here in LA. He then worked, teamed up and worked with Light in the Attic to get this album re-released, re reissued, and it became a cult classic almost immediately, and, you know, Ariel Pink covered Baby, that blew up. Donnie and Joe got back together and have done reunion shows. There's like a documentary about this, the story behind this album. And this is a quintessential uh, private press. And uh, it's on the Enterprise and Co. label, Donnie and Joe's own imprint. The story about the, of this album has been told many times, so I won't waste your time with it here. But this is a perfect example of how amazing and how successful uh, upon rediscovery a private pressing like that can be. Here's an example of one that probably will never be reissued, and even if it does get reissued, will not be commercially successful. Buck Barker's Rockin' All Night Long. This is a super wasted home recorded album. Uh, so hard to describe, but it's super unique. I can't think of another album that sounds quite like this. If there's anything that sounds like this, it's Stephen David Height Cotter's uh, album, or um, let's see, Circuit Rider, that record. This is super wasted outsider music. Um, it literally sounds like the artist was just drunk as hell and in the best possible way, Buck Barker comes highly recommended. Shout out to Dante for turning me on to Buck Barker many, many years ago. This album, Bobby Brown, this is not a difficult to find. This is not an expensive private pressing, but it is definitely worth your time. This is a very, very unique freak folk album. It's super psychedelic. Bobby Brown, obviously not that Bobby Brown, Re self released three albums back in the day, and he also was so DIY that he made his own instruments. I don't have time to get into the story of Bobby Brown in this particular video, but I highly recommend checking out The Enlightening Beam of Exanda by Bobby Brown. This is a very trippy album and is uh, a quintessential private pressing. We also, in the world of private pressings, have a lot of experimental electronic music. We sourced stock copies of the entire Ray Booty Gig um, catalog. Quantum Mechanics is one of my favorites. He self-released these albums back in the day. Not terribly dissimilar, but more electronic than what we've listened to in the, or what we've been listening to in the background of this video. This Dennis the Fox Mother Trucker is an amazing, super funky kind of swamp rock private pressing. 
Look at that picture of Dennis the Fox there. This has been reissued as well um, and is on, I think, the Feel the Music or Enjoy the Experience compilation. Both of those books I mentioned earlier also have uh, soundtracks or I should say um, companion compilations that you can check out, probably stream as well. Ted Lucas. Ted Lucas is an amazing artist. This album, unfortunately, I think he's no longer with us. This album features the artwork, early artwork by the same guy who did uh, album art for Journey, etc. Anyway, Ted Lucas, I heard a track of Ted's on a Etsy, an Etsy commercial over the holidays. Um, just another amazing success story. Uh, my pal Douglas McGowan reissued this album. This is an original pressing. Um, I think the reissue is out of print currently. Um, but yeah, that record is definitely worth your time. And I have a whole stack of records here to talk about, but I simply do not have time to get into it right now. Uh, this video ran very long, so I think I'll do a part two. And uh, let's just say at this point, to be continued. If you'd like to see part two of this video, please subscribe to this channel, like this video, ring the bell to be notified when part two is available, and shoot me a comment and let me know what you think about these particular records and some of your favorite private pressings. Until next time, keep digging.